That's recording. And here comes the open. They said it couldn't be done. They said it wouldn't last. White man, black man, America F1. <laughs> America F1, coming to you straight from San Francisco, California, Sherman Tillman, Michael Lawler. America F1. All right. Welcome to another episode of America F1. In today's episode, we are doing a Canadian Grand Prix recap. We have our special guest today. We have Paul and Scott. Paul all the way from Ireland and Scott all the way from New York. Hi, guys. Hey, Sherman. What's going on? How are you? Well, hey, today, hey. let's get right into it. Hey, Paul. How you doing out there? Oh, pretty right. good. So we're going to talk about the Canadian Grand Prix, and we're going to do a recap right now. And Scott was so lucky to be at the race this weekend. So tell us what, what you saw and maybe what you didn't see and what we didn't see on the television. Sure. Uh, I was a guest of uh, Red Bull Racing. I was in their uh, paddock club suite. We go to about five races a year. This time we decided to try Red Bull Racing, first time we ever did. So I got to hear from the inside what was actually going on between the Red Bull drivers and the uh, garage and the race engineers. Um, the, the real story of, of this GP was this was really a race that Max Verstappen should have come in P8, P9, P10, because the real story when the sort of communications were turned off to the public was the drivers were going crazy to the pit wall, to their engineers, to the team principal, that the cars were almost undrivable. And that was as late as FP3. That is on Saturday, a few hours before quali, they couldn't go over the curbs, they had no grip, they didn't know what to do. So this was not some, you know, sandbagging or anything like that on Friday. This was right before quali with, with the public not listening, only insiders that had the pit link. That is only Red Bull guests and sponsors could hear. The drivers were telling the, the, their people, their, their race engineers, that they couldn't drive the cars in any way that were competitive. And how Max was, was able to get a P2 in quality, set the table and put him in a position to take advantage of a safety car that really was reverse karma for what happened to him in Miami, where Lando had a really well-timed safety car that won him the race. And in this position in Montreal, what happened was exactly the opposite. Logan Sargent, the American, Lick the American Nicholas Latifi, fins <laughs> the car again, the king of the <laughs> Doctor's championship. I, I mean, he's the poster boy for someone who, you know, I'm an American, but he doesn't belong in F1. He lacks the talent. We got to get in somebody good. So Logan bends the car again, and then McLaren actually rolls the dice and makes a fatal error. So Lando has enough time to pit, but they're worried about a red flag that could, that could put him way down the order. So they don't pit him. They know there's debris on the track. And they're thinking maybe there's going to be a red flag because of the American Nicholas Latif. So they don't pit him. And sure enough, right after he crosses the pit entry, we see him cross the pit entry. Guess what? Safety car. So poor Lando goes an entire lap around the Canadian Grand Prix, you know, the Villeneuve circuit, you know, at what is it, 60 kPa, whatever it is. Um, and poor Lando goes right away, you know, he comes around. Everybody pit pits. I'm taking video. You know, everyone else is pitting. You know, they've got the right tires now. They've got a new set of pinchers, I think, at the time. And he's trundling around at 60 kph around this really long circuit. And sure enough, by the time poor Lando gets out, he goes from a 12-second lead, lapping one second per lap faster than either Max or George. He was lapping a second per lap faster. He was going to win. He was sailing off into the sunset with a 12-second lead a bigger lead than Max or George ever had. I mean, he was basically pulling a Max on Max. This was like 2023 all over again, but with the orange car leading, with the papaya car leading, saying, bye, right. guys, I'll see you in the next race. And then they made a fatal error. And so then poor Lando comes out P3, 
race over. We all know what happens when you put Max in the lead, clear air, whatever. You know, it's over. Um, Paul, what do you, what what do you, what's your reaction to uh, what that, Scott just brought George, to the table? Now, I don't. I obviously I don't think Scott, you were. Uh, because you were trackside, you probably didn't hear. But what we heard uh, was Lando saying, you know, oh, I think there should, you know, there's debris on the track. I think there should be a safety car. So he was calling for that safety car to come <laughs> and he wanted it to happen. But his timing was completely off. So he he got roasted on this. And I have to say, I don't believe that was Max's race to win. Uh, no. I think there was errors from... Sort there was errors from Mercedes, there was errors from Ferrari, uh, there was errors from from uh, McLaren, and it wasn't a case of wet weather problems. Uh, I just think that they got their maneuvers, they got their pit calls, they got their strategies wrong, and that is why uh, Max got to win yesterday. I don't believe that the car is for that particular track. Maybe we don't know if it's track sp specific at this time, but certainly uh, that was not the strongest car for the track. In other words, for yesterday. And it was um, it, it was very disappointing that Max won. And it's not a case of, oh, you know, I don't like Max. It's a case of there was too many errors from other teams yesterday that allowed Max to win. But I don't believe that Max had the strongest car yesterday in any way, shape or form. He didn't. And he knew he did it. And in fact, Max spoke shortly before the race to the Red Bull Paddock Club. And he was beaming ear to ear. And you don't often see Max when he qualifies P2 when he doesn't have Paul happy. And you know what he said? He said, I don't deserve to be in P2. We don't deserve to be in P2. Mm -hmm. We don't have the car for this. So he was super happy that he, that, that he really did a great quality lap to get in P2 because he didn't think he deserved to be there. Max and Checo both thought the car was garbage on this track. And Paul, yeah. you're right. Didn't have the car to win. It shouldn't have won. But you had George you know, making a couple of yeah. big mistakes. Like, unfortunately, George is not Lewis. And when the pressure is on, yeah. George has repeatedly made mistakes uh, when he shouldn't have. And uh, on McLaren's part, it was really a matter of just not bringing Lando in right away when we all knew there was going to be a safety car and just, just blowing that 12 second lead and that, and Max, you know, drove a great race. Like he usually does. because He's like a machine and just not putting Max's driving brilliance, put him in a position to win. And, and oh, I mean, I my, the, oh, my whole take is that Max made the least amount of mistakes out of the top yep. three, top four drivers. Because you could see Hamilton went off, uh, Oscar went off, and Lando went off, but they went off like went off. multiple times, and Max only went off that one time. And I think there was one a of the biggest one of the biggest errors was Lando's exit from the pits when he changed his tires, and he yes. came out sideways, and Max just sailed past him. He sailed past him. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't he, think Lando's all that good in the wet, to be honest. He he screwed himself back in I think it was Russia uh, originally right. out of a win years yeah. ago. He, mm -hmm. he, I don't think he's good at wet. On the power, like, he definitely he was too generous with the throttle. Yeah, he, he was too generous with the throttle. We, we saw Yuki last year, I remember, uh, in the dry, I think, uh, go right off into the wall in the same pit exit because that's that corner pit exit where it's a sharp turn. And, you know, when you have those high horsepower rear wheel drive cars and you have no traction aids in those cars, and when it's wet on top of that, you know, only because he's skilled, he kept the car going straight at all. He saved it. But sure. when you lose traction like that, you lose all your speed. Uh, and that's what yeah. happened. One of the things that I thought was interesting before we get into our 10 to 1 was it just shows that if they just would almost artificially wet the track sometimes <laughs> and like on some of these boring races, it would make the racing so much better. Yeah. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, okay, we know, and like Imola, there's not going to be that much passing. It's like basically Monaco, but out in the open. So maybe we'll artificially wet the track ahead of time. And now there's a lot more strategy that goes into it. And you saw all the strategy blunders. And then you saw a team like Haas take a chance and put everybody on and put both their drivers on wet. And they're right up in the, I mean, Magnuson, he looked 
I, mean, I didn't even know who that driver was. He was four passing laps. everybody like, like they were four standing laps, still. Four laps is all they got. Four laps of oh. heroism. And then they fell he right back. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he went from P14 to P4 yeah. in the course of about four laps. But it, it also shows you something else, though. It shows you that if you take a Formula One driver and you put him in a good car, what they can do. And when you see somebody like a K-Mag or a Nico Hulkenberg, where everyone makes fun of because he doesn't have a podium, where they give him a hard time, you know, put, put Nico in a Red Bull one race, put him in a Ferrari and see what he can do. You know, right. they, they, it's, okay. it's a great driver who's never, who just does not have a great car. There's, there is an age old argument and it stems back to, what was the film with Tom Cruise? Days of Thunder. Okay. Days of Thunder. You remember when you remember when the two racers were in higher cars and they were going to the hotel to meet their bosses? <laughs> the run the people that ran Days of Thunder, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So the two of them crashed the hell out of each other. They drove like crazy. They were in two higher cars of equal measure. Okay. So the age old argument is if we could get all 20 drivers into saloon cars and they were identical, right. how would they fare? What would they be? I don't know if you guys ever saw the Top Gear test track uh, where they used to bring stars on, but occasionally they brought on F1 drivers. So Ricardo right. did it, uh, Lewis did it, and a few other guys. The, the point is, it, it, absolutely in the same cars, uh, how would all of these drivers fare? Right. Uh, but that's not Formula One, and, and that's why we have to. And when you mention things like, you know, put them in the same car or give the other guys a chance to drive a different car. So in other words, K-Mag gets to drive a Red Bull, etc. Uh, the point is, they're all yeah. very, very skilled drivers, but... Mm -hmm. For Formula One, we will never see this. The whole point is the pinnacle of motorsport and the pinnacle of driver, the pinnacle of the machine, the pinnacle of the engineers, the aerodynamics. That is what makes Formula One. So we will never get the equality. We'll never get where they are absolutely in the same machine to test their true skill. It will well, never they're, happen. They're all really good except for Logan Sargent. <laughs> well, that's a given, yeah. But look, Let's can I just say one thing? One. I, I don't like gimmicks. Okay, I don't. I'm a, I'm a purist for Formula One. I've been mm -hmm. doing this. I've been watching it since I was five. I'm 59. I I hate that we have sprint races. I hate when they try to do things like DRS or or you know all of these things. They they're just cheap tricks. What are we going to do next? Are we going to have it where they where they get voted a driver boost like they did in Formula E? Are we going to get it where they drive over a certain zone and and they oh, get wow. a bomb? A bomb coming out of the back like an oil bomb or something oh. it, it, they're just cheap tricks and i just i want the purest of racing that's what i want that, okay. that's all i'm saying I feel bad for a hulkenberg with no podium and you know he's very little chance of ever getting one well he's going to go to audi next well, i mean you never know audi in the next couple of years may may be able to do well, it for him. you never know yeah. first they got one, team one. Team so team team one is a segment where we Go and we go backwards on the score, the point scoring drivers, and we talk about each one, and we talk about where they qualified and where they finished, and we give them maybe a little tidbit of what we saw during the race. So that way, everybody gets their shout out. We get to talk about each driver, and starting with Esteban Ocon, who qualified in 18th and finished 10th and got his one point. Who wants to start? I'll be happy to start. Go ahead, Scott. Ocon is a great driver whose career has been hobbled by the fact that he's a reputation for being a bad teammate. Ocon once again showed that he really is a very good driver. He, he was, you know, eight positions up from where he started. Uh, and then, you know, you saw the big uh, scandal with Ocon was that he was given orders, to let Gasly pass. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he resisted the team orders. He asked, uh, if they could swap back positions at the end of the race, they said no, hold position. Not surprising given that he got the boot for next year. So Ocon delays executing the team orders, allowing Daniel Ricciardo, you know, Mr. Ricciardo, to, to increase his gap so he keeps that P8. So Gasly, when he is let by by Ocon, can't possibly pass him or can't possibly catch up. Uh, and then Ocon, you know, not doing himself any favors at all at the end of the race on team radio says, you know, no comment. I'm too nice. I've done what I had to do, which is most important, but you guys didn't do what you had to do. That's it. I'm sorry. But when you're looking for a new job, that is an advertisement to a team like Ferrari 
intervene and say, I'm not allowing this man to be mm. Ali Behrman's new teammate. This is a young, new driver who needs a mentor. I want somebody like a Valtteri Bottas in there to train him and mentor him, not some guy like Ocon who's going to drive him off the track. That, oh. That's a great drive, bad teammate, lousy team player. And it's Paul, what do you, what do you got to add to what Ocon had to say after the race? I, well, after the race, uh, what he said was uh, he's got a team to go to. And uh, I don't know which team that's going to be, but he's got a drive. And that's what he said. It is part of the reason I chose to leave the team. So the the press and the piranhas believe that he got fired. Actually, I think he'd already signed up and has a, a new deal before all of this came out that he was leaving the team. And it was just coincidental that at the last race, he had the incident that he did in Monaco and everybody, you know, were jumping on him. Um, Ocon is one of the ones that came up without funds, without money. He had to do it the hard way. Um, I think that actually in the right car, he could be a good driver. He's extremely aggressive. He takes a few too many chances. And he, uh, look, when we say he's not a team player, he just doesn't like Gasly. He really doesn't like him. And putting them together was always going to come to blows. That was a bad decision by Otmar, no question. And I'm a big Otmar fan. But it was, you know, fire and water. And in fact, when, you know, Alpine announced that they were not renewing him. Uh, uh, Gasly liked the post uh, from F1. Um, but Ocon's had other problems. I mean, Alonso and Ocon didn't get along mm -hmm. at all. Harry Checo, who gets along with everybody, didn't get along at all with Ocon. They were ready to murder each other. Yeah. So no, I don't think he's a good team player. Yeah. He doesn't play well with others. <laughs> you have to ask yourself, you know, if there's a common denominator there in the teammate issue, Where's the problem coming from? And it's a shame because Ocon is an excellent driver. And by the way, as someone, like I said, who goes to about five races in the paddock of the year, he is awesome with fans. He's among the nicest, most, most, most generous with his time drivers you'll find. He's a salt of the earth guy because he came from nothing. Family sold their home and they lived in a camper. And unfortunately, that one aspect of his career has really been his Achilles heel. And I, I, I hope he's he got a chip on his shoulder. You think he has a chip on his shoulder? It's not a chip on his shoulder. It's the terror of somebody who's who's terrified of losing his job because he grew up in a mentality exactly. where his family gave everything to his yeah. career. So their home had nothing to keep him carted. And, and so that's not knowing not knowing where he's going to go next year. And I really, I really don't know what team he's going to. Um, but I think the, the, the difference might be that if he's the lead driver in a team next year, maybe we might see a different Ocon because then he might have a junior with him, as you say, Ollie, Ollie Berman or half a dozen other guys that we all believe now should have a seat. Um, and I mean, maybe we're talking Haas here, but uh, you know that honestly i like to call that uh, swapping seats in the titanic um Haas is not going to offer any driver on that grid not even a newbie uh, uh a, res a, a response uh, a decent car because Haas is just not going to put the money into that team and develop that car but um i think that if ocon was lead driver perhaps in one of the teams we might see a different uh, a different driver i agree with what both of you had to say i think ocon he wears his heart. He kind of like Lewis. He wears his heart on his sleeve, but he may need a little PR training because he's always so competitive that you kind of don't have that feeling that he even cares about his teammate or what, what, what anybody in management has to say. It's all about him because like you said, he grew up in maybe meager means his family did everything they could for him to get into Formula One. And so he never wants to feel that he's given anybody an advantage. And so because of that, he doesn't know how to turn that switch off like a boxer, like a really championship boxer can't turn it off. Like if you remember Mike Tyson and his interviews, he could never turn that off. And I think Ocon has that same type of issue where he can't turn it off. And he mm -hmm. needs to, especially if he's with a young driver that they want to kind of coddle and bring up through the ranks he doesn't need to be there to destroy that person's confidence sure. and i think that's might 
what he would do. So I'm hoping that they don't, he doesn't go to Haas. I hope he, maybe he's going to Sauber. Maybe he has another plan. I hope because yeah, I, well, I anybody, that, anybody that goes to Sauber is heading for Audi the following year because Sauber has been bought. Right. So, right. Saudi is, Sauber is Audi and the next year is just going to be a play around for them. Um, I don't see any advantages coming out of it. Um, so no, I don't no, think it's going to be that. That's correct. Let's, let's move on to Gasly, who finished in ninth place. He qualified mm -hmm. 15th. Paul, yeah. why don't you take the lead on uh, what do you got to say about Gasly's uh, finish? I think, he drove, I think he drove a fair race. I, I think he kept it sort of fairly clean. I think he did get a bump, didn't he, at the start with somebody. He, he touched with Perez. Didn't he he did have Perez? a he, – he actually, when he had a bump, he turned not a whole 360, but about a 180. And he mm -hmm. had to 180 around. So that's right. a pretty good finish from a person who pretty much was near the end of the pack with that spin. Yep. So I think he drove a fairly good race. Um, we who who we don't know who was at fault for for the incident because neither of them got penalised. Right yeah, between between himself, Perez, and I think one other person was it Bottas. I think it was Bottas. There was three of them in the initial bump. Well, was, we I didn't we was... didn't actually really see it. We just sort of saw it afterwards and and an investigation, but then it wasn't investigated. Right lap one incident. Yeah, lap one. So. And... Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Happens usually. Scott, so. you got anything to add about uh, Pierre? Uh, you know, another solid drive from Pierre. I mean, it's, uh, you know, he's been way in sort of the minus column in relation to Ocon. Um, and frankly, I think the team wanted to be sure that he was in the plus column in this race. And, you know, especially that he's the one staying. I think the team definitely wanted to help him. You know, very interesting bone of contention that I didn't go over is Ocon is claiming in the media that Pierre has a lighter car than he does. Um, that's the latest bone of contention uh, I've been reading today, that, that uh, Ocon is claiming that uh, Pierre has an advantage over him now, that, that his car is, in fact, lighter. I don't know if it's true or not, but it, it did look a little bit faster. Uh, and uh, Pierre took advantage of it. And uh, uh, I would also say that uh, what you're seeing now is Alpine is no longer P, uh, P last. And you are seeing them uh, improving the car, lightening the car, uh, you know, running sort of running more for the midfield now, which is where you sort of expect them to be. But it's taken them a very painful uh, first part of the season to get there. I certainly do not expect them to have a McLaren like development path where they go from P nothing to the front of the field. That's almost unprecedented. Um, but they are sort of more heading to where I expected them to be this year, which is right in sort of in the middle. Uh, I did have, I did spend about an hour uh, at the Miami Grand Prix sitting next to Otmar uh, Safnauer uh, in the Aston Martin Paddock Club. And uh, I know Otmar expressed to me that he was not particularly surprised uh, at where Alpine was, given that so much of the staff was replaced. Um, and I think you've seen the effects of that. You've seen a lot of very senior people uh, be replaced with people who don't have as much experience. And I think the team is really, I mean, the turnover has been massive at Alpine and you've, I, you've seen them struggle. Uh, but now you're starting to see them come back a little bit. I don't see them being greater than midfield, but you, you know, you see a P9 and P10 being sort of where about you'd expect them to be, somewhere. In Paul, there. what do you think about Pierre's drive? Uh, yesterday, yeah, I think he was solid yesterday. I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna labor on certain drivers when I'm also sort of uh, aware of the time as well. Um, I think Pierre drove a solid race yesterday. I couldn't fault him particularly, and I think they got his pit calls correct, um, <laughs> which was important for him. Um, and he came home pretty much where he deserved to be. Finishing in eighth place was Daniel Ricardo. <laughs> who qualified fifth, and as we all know, we had Jacques Villeneuve, Villeneuve oh, with yes. his motivational speaking that he had pre Grand Prix. Do you think that really gave Daniel the motivation that he needed to finish in eighth place, or do you all you just think it was just time and everything I, came together for Daniel? I, I think I think uh, Jacques Villeneuve should stay retired. 
Uh, I think he's a little poison dwarf and um, he's he's got a vicious <laughs> mouth on him. He's got a vicious mouth on him. He looks like Jean-Luc Picard. Um, he, you know, the guy I mean, that's Picard. a good thing. That, that's a good thing. I mean, Jean-Luc is a good looking guy. Come on. He, older yeah, man, he, I mean, he's a good looking guy, you know? I, look, I have a major, major issue. And I actually wrote a post about this in a couple of the clubs. Uh, and my, my issue is this. People like uh, Bernie, uh, Jackie Stewart, um, uh, Ralph Schumacher, Eddie Jordan, and people like Jacques Villeneuve, they, they do their absolute best to stay relevant by coming out with these absurd, sometimes incredibly either racist or uh, just unfounded comments from a lot of them, just so they can stay relevant in the press and people can just pay attention to them. And it really annoys me. And I wish they would just, you know, once you're retired, just go away. I'm being polite here. <laughs> just go away. I have a take on things. I think Rick Dan, I think Daniel's an incredibly talented driver who's gotten too relaxed and has the talent. But I think um, pe people who, a lot of people who want to see him stay in F1 and would like to see him do better might have actually, in retrospect, been a little grateful for the kick in the tail that JV gave him. No, I find JV annoying too. But um, I think it may have given Daniel, I think it may have made him angry. And I will tell you in my law practice, sometimes there are some lawyers who do better in court when you make them mad before they go to court that without doing that, they're too relaxed and they don't have the killer instinct anymore. And sometimes you need to get them mad. And I think Ricardo got so angry that he wanted to show him and show the world that he still has it. And you saw quality, the old Daniel Ricardo came back just like he did in Miami uh, in the sprint race, certainly not in the main race. But I got to tell you, you know, the, the problem this season and last season, the old Daniel Ricciardo hasn't been there enough. And Yuki has been wiping the floor with him, and it's been embarrassing. Yes, this race, the shoe was on the other foot, but this season has been embarrassing. I mean, Yuki has really humiliated him. But let me tell you, you saw the happiest Daniel Ricciardo I saw Daniel Ricardo um, right after the race in front of the uh, the paddock building, the team house of uh, you know it used to be Alcatari, now it's RB or whatever they call themselves, with uh, Laurent Mekis and Peter Bayer, and I've never seen him so happy, so relaxed, and so happy. The three they had this animated conversation with the fourth person who I don't know who it was, and I watched them for a couple of minutes, and let me tell you, the, the happiest guy I think. Other than no, I don't even match. I'm the happiest guy walking away from that race was Daniel Ricciardo. If I if I may, um, I, I, we had a conversation the last time I was on the podcast with you, Sherman, uh, yes. about Daniel, and and we sort of I I specifically said that once he had left Red Bull and was on the money train to go to I think it was Renault at the time. Then the money train swapped over to McLaren and then he sort of got dumped. Um, but he still made money, even though he did get end up in a court case and had to give about, I think, 10 million of that to somebody else. Um, once that happened and he was sort of booted off and the next thing was Red Bull threw him a, a lifeline. And then suddenly he's not doing advertising and shows for them. He's actually driving in the junior car. And, you know, I, I don't think the junior car is giving him what he needs uh, in the sense of, uh, I, I think he's a little insecure. I also think that Daniel's lost his edge. Um, mm. It happens with some drivers, and I think Daniel's lost his edge. Um, would he perform better than Sergio Perez if he was in the senior Red Bull car? No, he wouldn't. And and that is saying something, and we haven't even got to Sergio, and we will. But I, I just think Daniel has lost the edge. And I, I, I know he had a great day yesterday, and I'm delighted for him. He's a nice guy. We've, nobody's got anything bad to say about Daniel. But I just think he's on the money train. There are two. There are two people in Formula One. <clears throat> there is the guy that wins, the guy that wins the championships, makes a lot of money, and then there's the guys that know they will never get the chance again to be in a championship-winning car, and therefore they get on the money train. And Daniel is on the money train. Yeah, finishing, in, finishing in seventh place was one of. Everybody's favorite driver, Lance Stroll. He qualified in ninth. Mm -hmm. And really, I have nothing to say about Lance Stroll because when you interview him, he has nothing to say. 
And he's probably one of the worst interviews on the grid. When you see him, you're just like, there's no chance of liking the guy. Like you want to like, like I want to like everybody. And so you give them the chance and you hear them speak and you're like, Oh, this is why I don't like this guy. You know, uh, he's, he's all, I mean, if anybody needs a PR class on how to talk to interviewers, how to get people to like you, how to win friends and family, it's Lance Stroll. He's just and, got no charisma. That's all. He's just got no charisma. He, he, he also, we got it. You know, the, the, the impression of uh, born with a silver spoon up his butt. It is true. I mean, it's never been truer than with Lance. Um, but he earned his way to getting to an F1 seat. I mean, you know, kind those of, that saw him in the hard. previous, yeah. eh, well, the, you know, the kind previous hard. formulas, the previous formulas that he was in, he was very good. Um, and, and okay, without daddy, he probably may not have got a Formula One seat, but he has got some brilliant moments. And one of his best strengths is in wet races. He's actually pretty good in wet racing. Like there, I said this to you recently, and I was saying it to Scott. Uh, there are four or five of those drivers that that excel in the wet. Lewis, Max, Stroll, <laughs> Alonso. You know the guys that weren't going off that often. The guys that can do that changeable weather pattern. They're the stars, but we just don't have that many wet races to show their brilliance. Right. So yeah, I think about, Stroll served his place yesterday. Yeah, I mean, my feeling about Lance Stroll having observed him a lot because I've been in the Aston Martin paddock club more than any other is he's very socially awkward. Uh, does not do well around people. He doesn't know. I have observed him in the paddock, like in Canada last year, he uh, literally put on the Aston Martin rain jacket on a sunny day and put the hood up around his head completely. So you can't see anything, but you could see out the eyes to walk through the paddock. That's how socially awkward he is. And I, I think he may be on the spectrum, to be perfectly honest. As someone yeah, who would, and I think Max is there as well. Not the same. Max no, is no, no, not as much. Not as them. much. I see both of them up close. It's not this. Max is in, on race day. He is intensely focused on the race, the point where he does not want a distraction. The second the race is over, Max is extremely personable, and it's a totally different animal. That's why a lot of the drivers like him personally. Lance doesn't have any friend on the grid other than Ocon. Lance and Ocon are friends. Correct. He's socially awkward. He really has problems with social interactions. As far as his driving goes, um, Lance is either great, Lance is either good to great or awful. And he's so inconsistent. And that's what's dogged him. Lance can come and do a P5, a P4, a P6, no problem. And then suddenly the next five races, he's P nothing. And yeah, look, he would not have a seat but for his dad. There's no question of that. Yeah, but, just... but we also, but I wonder if he was in one of the <laughs> real top team cars, would Lance do better? And um, I think he would. I, I don't think he has the, I don't think he has the wherewithal to actually win a championship, no matter how good the car is. I don't think he could take the pressure of a season if he was a, if he was a frontal runner. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, yeah, it's, yeah, it's anyway, it's... carry on, carry on. He he in sixth place was Fernando Alonso. He One of my favorites. was qualified in six, so he didn't go up a place. He didn't go down a place. He just had a solid drive, and I think he kept Lewis Hamilton behind him for lap after lap. It was probably like six, seven laps, and Lewis was right, <laughs> right on the wing, and he just couldn't pass him. He just couldn't yeah. do it. Even when they, uh, they had three DRS zones in Canada. And he still couldn't pass him. And I was like, huh. Now, either Lewis is just biding his time no. or he just can't get by this guy. He doesn't no. want to take the chance. There yeah. is no better yeah. wheel to wheel in Formula One than Fernando Alonso. Period. Full stop. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not the fastest anymore. He's 42. He's not the fastest on pure pace. But there is no better pure wheel to wheel racer in F1 than Alonso. He, mm. he constantly varies his line, his breaking points. This is what caused George Russell to crash in, you know, basically to almost crash into him and then crash out in Australia. He is just so good at fooling and confusing the person trying to overtake him. He, the reason that's why he's called the old fox. He's a brilliant wheel-to-wheel -wheel racer. Yeah. And the Aston Martin is not a great car this year, 
Um, both Aston Martin and Mercedes are having tremendous correlation problems between what is going on in the Mercedes wind tunnel, and what is going on in the track. And Aston's upgrades have been downgrades, probably because of the aerodynamic issues. And Aston, uh, come Silverstone, will finally have their wind tunnel working uh, 25 you know, yards away from where everyone is designing their cars on their Silverstone campus. And at that point, I know this because I spoke with people from the team yesterday. Um, and at, at that, they're very excited because there's frustrations with the Mercedes wind tunnel that it's just not giving the correlation that they want. And you see that from Mercedes too. But given the car that Fernando had, P6 was a great result and as good as they could really hope for. A better Paul? result. Thanks, did Paul, what do you think? I have to say ditto because Alonso, as long as he stays fit and agile and mentally able and has got half a car under him, he will get the best out of it and he will drive flawlessly. And if he is in front of you, you're in trouble, especially if you have the same engine. Now we have Oscar Piastri finishing in fifth place. He qualified in fourth and it looked like for a time, he was one of the quickest guys on the track. And then something happened. And I think it was when Russell passed him. I think Russell, well, I don't think, I know he, I know he wheel bumped him. And actually Lando had talked about it in, in the, uh, the Max uh, podcast at, you know, the cool down room. That's what they call the cool down room, the Max podcast, because he's always there. Mm -hmm. So in the cool down room, Lando said, oh, so racing now is he made a reference to the wheel bump. How mm -hmm. when Russell passes a lot of times, unless it's Lewis, it's not the cleanest of passes. And what do you think about that, Paul? I'll let you take a lead on this one. I, I, <laughs> which part do you want me to talk about? The Russell part? Whatever you'd like. Get to? <laughs> um, Just talk, I think talk a Piastri, little bit about Oscar's I think, race. I think, I think Piastri is a solid racer, but I'm starting to see a pattern uh, with him, with George, with all the secondary drivers in most of the teams. Perez, when, when, when the pressure comes, it's just something gives a little bit and then they fall back. So they start strong and then they fall back in the first quarter. Some of it, I'm sure, is from the team. They're telling them to cool the tires. They're telling them to cool the brakes. All those kind of things are going on in the headsets. Everything's going a bit wild, but they just seem to lose a bit of ground. And Piastri seems to uh, does qualification well, does quality well. Yes, and yes. then when he has the positions, he tends to fall back, which is the, the current trend of most of the P2 drivers. And I don't mean I don't mean quality two. I mean the P two of a team. Um, they they just buckle a bit under pressure. And this is a conversation we're going to repeat when it comes to higher up the grid on, on today's conversation. So um, I think Piastri w did well to stay fifth. I think he did. I think he did well to get there. I think it could have been that he could have slipped back further. Yeah, I mean he's a super talented driver. He's still a little young, uh, you know, and. Uh, Still working on his race management, you know, his tire management skills, and I think he's still he is not at Lando's level yet. That uh, he certainly has plenty of aggression, uh, relentless, doesn't back down. He has the mindset of a champion, no question about it. He's brutal when he wants to be, and very unemotional, and determined, doesn't back down. But he doesn't yet have those tire race management skills and the race craft of a champion yet. He is still he's learning. Got precision. He's got precision. Correct. In a way that like Max would crash even much more than Oscar did at that age. Oscar is more moderate in his emotions. Max is fiery, especially at that age. Uh, Oscar is more, much more measured, like an Alain Prost that way. But he's not there yet and doesn't have four, five, six, seven years of race grade. Right. Yeah. And so it won't, it won't you can see the long. potential in Oscar that down the road, once he gets some of the other things that you need as a race mm. champion, he he yeah. definitely will. And, and and he's um he's got time. There's no rush yeah. at yeah, McLaren. Sure. They're not going to kick him. And no. also, I think that he will come good. And I don't think that he's too aggressive with other drivers on the track. So he's he's not polite, but he's not. He doesn't give it up easy, but mm -hmm. he also doesn't threaten. He doesn't cause danger. Uh, yeah. He knows when to back out, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I, I yeah. kind of like Oscar. I think he's. I like Oscar. Um, yeah. I, I out of the younger drivers, he's one of my favorites. 
because mm-hmm. what I like about him is he seems like he's the consummate team player when th- there was a time when he was the fastest person on track and they asked him, Hey, do you want to switch with Lando? Do you think you can keep max? And then he said, I have enough problems. I think at that time it was <laughs> Hamilton or George right behind him. I think it was Hamilton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have enough problems right now. Keeping this guy yeah. behind me. Let me just but, concentrate on that. And I said, I- what yet a lot of other drivers would say yeah let's switch and let me see if i can go and get you know max but he said you know what let me just stay here and figure out how to keep this guy behind me so maybe lando can have a chance at. and i love that about him and i don't there, hear other drivers doing that and i really there that's is what a I'm small thinking. there's a small issue with this which is it that was a perfect bit of timing because normally it's been a minute or two between the actual conversation between driver and pit and when they actually air those messages and it just so happened that they were you know sort of really having a tussle at that stage and he was trying to keep lewis off his back at the time but um there is just that there's such a, a, a distance between the transmission of those conversations and what the what the people that air the actual messages the, the gap is quite long it can be like two or three minutes previous uh, so we're just we happened to see it really close at that time when it got aired right. and it was nicely timed. Well, finishing in fourth place was Lewis Hamilton. He qualified seventh and out of the top <clears throat> six or seven drivers, he had the most uh, places uh, gained. And I thought he had a really good race. Uh, he's <laughs> very racy. He made a couple mistakes and he's he said that this was he thought his worst race of his career that's what he said and when you consider that him saying that this was the worst race of his career and he still had a chance i think there was a point in time where he could have finished like second or third there was a good point in that race where he really was the fastest man on track and he did get the fastest lap of the race but i do question i mean mercedes and their their strategy i do question putting on the hard with only 15 laps left. And they said the soft wouldn't last, but it's only 15 laps. So I didn't really understand. And it's cooler, so I thought the softs could have worked. Even put them on old mediums. But I I knew once they put the hards on that that's just, you know, he's either going to stay where he's at, maybe he'll pass George, and which he did, and then George passed him back. Obviously. Uh, being a being a huge Lewis fan, uh, obviously I tried to read and follow and listen to whatever. So apparently he'd already been on the mediums when they did the stint on those particular tires. Um, so he didn't actually have the option. It was either going to be old softs or the brand new mediums. And I think there was a concern that the track was still wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry in certain places. And they went with the hards. And as it turns out, it was a disastrous move. I mean, we saw how fast George was able to catch on the mediums and, and how he was able to catch him out of a corner and just jet through him. And it was it was a disastrous moment. But, you know, that is the difference, basically, between mediums and hards. Uh, and yesterday was a lesson. And Lewis made very few mistakes but he obviously didn't enjoy the race i think he probably thought he should have got past alonso earlier or a pit call mm-hmm. should have been made earlier i know i was screaming at the television for the team to call him in a bit sooner um at, so that you know alonso it was obvious once in clear air he was doing much faster times than alonso had been doing alonso caused him to be gapped between the like alonso and the next car by i think it was something like 10 or 12 seconds So it was obvious that Alonso was actually slower, but Lewis just wasn't confident enough at any point to actually pass him uh, because of the wet, wet, dry, wet, dry and incoming rain. Uh, And it was a a real shame. And I I think that it was Lewis could have been in second, uh, maybe second, possibly challenging for first. But I'm not going to wave that flag. But, you know, I, I do think he would have been much higher up the grid. Um, how do you have been able to disperse of um, or get rid of Alonso sooner? Well, because of time constraints, you know what we're going to do, Scott, is we're going to let you talk about George Russell, who finished in third place, and he qualified on the pole. Uh, Well, this was the race of Mr. Saturday. I mean, he had a a great quality, although Lewis said that – Every time that he went out into the garage, his tires were for some reason below temperature, that it was every set was two or three degrees lower than it should have been. And maybe there was a problem with the blanket. So Lewis was 
uh, alleging or hinting or implying maybe he was sabotaged to advantage George. Uh, that he that um, every, it was great in the practices, and the minute he got into quality, they didn't give him temp tires in the right temperature window, and he couldn't bring them up, and that's why he finished where he did. George did great in quality, uh, no question. He, he got to the race, and as we've discussed, uh, he made some you know he made a couple of significant errors driving, and you know including banging Oscar's wheels and heading off the track, and then earlier having a bit of an excursion. Um, and you know George still has not shown me that he has the discipline yet, the mental sort of focus to be champion. And that's really what he has to work on because he certainly has the speed and the talent. And it's, it's just that last bit of focus when you're in the race, not to bottle it. That's something that has sort of dogged Charles Leclerc at times, uh, especially in the 2022 season. And it's something that George needs to focus on, you know, seeing that this year and seeing uh, what happened in Singapore and things like that. That's, that's what George needs to focus on. This this was a race that, in his mind, he should have won. He was not happy with P3. He apologized to Mercedes. Uh, and um, that's sort of the story of George, I think, in this race. Although, frankly, Lando had the best car on track and probably all things being equal, mm -hmm. should have won. Uh, I know you I know you suggested that maybe Scott was just going to answer this, but I just want to add one thing. As, um, as a moderator on, on a couple of big clubs, in support of Mercedes and Lewis, uh, the hammering that George is getting is—it's um, hard to defend him at the moment because I feel, as I said earlier, about the number two drivers in the teams, that uh, George is acting as if he is a number one driver, but when it comes to track time, I think he's acting like Bottas used to, which is he can do a good quality, he can start a good race, he can stay ahead, and then within a few laps, he's losing it. And then he starts yelling at the, the pit wall. Um, his strategies go wrong. He burns his tires up too quickly. And I just think that he gets a bit hot under the collar. And I just don't think that he's he's not the full package yet, not nearly. And you know what? I don't think he is. And I don't know, even if the Mercedes comes out dominant in 2026, if he's gonna be able to win a championship. It's just a personal I don't think view. George Russell is a championship driver. I, I just don't. I think yeah. he makes too many mistakes. I think he yeah. mentally, because remember, there was a point in time when Toto said, George, concentrate. Remember okay. that? He said okay. that. Okay. And I just think he has lapses of concentration. And remember, to be that championship driver, you have to do that same lap time again, again, again. 20 laps, yeah. 30 laps, again and again and again. And I don't think George is at that level. I just don't – and I don't ever think – I think it's either in you or it's not, you know. And I, I for George, I just don't – I don't see him ever winning a championship. Yeah, even if he had the best car. And Fernando. Those are the guys that when they have the car, you'll see those repeatable lap times, lap after lap after lap. Yeah. Max, Will, and Fernando can all do that. Did you guys That's see the replay? Did you guys see the replay of George passing Lewis? Mm-hmm. Like he nearly put the it sideways. replay. I saw. I mean, I saw it when he passed him. Well, he nearly put it sideways. No, like what, 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 he, what he nearly different put it on the grass? In the replay where George passed uh, Lewis, he nearly puts it sideways. Like it was not a clean pass. It was not a clever pass. It was. It was a slightly stupid pass. He could because the back wheel kinked. He easily could have gone into Lewis. For real, mm. it was a risk that wasn't worth taking. And I really wonder what I would love to have had the headphones on in Mercedes to have heard where they thought that was OK, because the pre message we got a second or two beforehand was clean racing, boys, clean racing. And then the next thing is George is going right. after going after Lewis. And I just thought it was it was it, I knew I know he was his car was faster, but he took a chance. He actually took a chance. And Lewis was kind. Lewis could have made it more difficult for him not to pass. Oh, yeah, he could have put him in the grass easily. If it was Max, yeah. he would have put him in the grass, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could have blocked him. Finishing in second forward. place was Lando Calrissian Norris. He <laughs> qualified in third. <laughs> he qualified in third. And to me, he got the driver of the day. I mean, I don't know if he was the driver of the day in my book, but he had a really clean race. And I there was – quite a bit of time out there where it was no doubt that he was the fastest person on track. He was driving like balls out to the wall. And if it wasn't for that safety car, he probably would have won that race by 20 seconds. No doubt. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, no, I mean, 
the crowd really wanted Lando, and you know, you, you had to feel for Max that when when they were playing, you know, the Dutch national anthem, the crowd was chanting at the top of its lungs, thousands of people, Lando, Lando, Lando. The crowd really wanted Lando to win. They felt that he got robbed by the safety car, but it was the reverse of Miami. That's just racing. Um, you know, Lando wasn't particularly upset by it because he remembers Miami and he and Max are friends. Lando did a great job. Look, McLaren is putting out a championship level car, whether it's probably too late now to win the championship. But the fact is they are taking a Mercedes PU and they are building a championship level car. All respect to Zach, to really to Andrea Stella and those people, they are doing a great job. Um, they really are. They're doing a fantastic, they, they've taken what has been sort of an upper midfield team and they are really building a championship level team. Very impressed. Yeah, it must be really something for Mercedes to have a customer team just beating them consistently the last two years. And it yep. must be something, you know how, if you've ever seen like after the end of the season, the, like the teams that are kind of close together where they, they have their factories close together, like one will come in front of the other factory and like raise their banner and kind of like make fun of them kind of. And I can't wait to see what McLaren does to Mercedes at the end of the year. Now finishing in first place, Super Max Verstappen qualified in second. He actually had the same qualifying time as George Russell. And because he went out second, they give the time or the pole position to the person who went out first. And so I can't remember that the last time that happened. I think that was a Schumacher era, if you guys can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, where and they finished the same lap time. Yeah, there was three of them actually in the same race. Uh, Jack Villeneuve and a, a gentleman I don't remember, and so they were they were telling us on Sky the other day. Um, I can't remember who the who the, the other three the other two were, but there was three identical. Do you cars. remember who that was, uh, Scott? Not off the top of my head. I knew there were three. It was, mm. Yeah, and they all you had could, the same exact laptop. We're, yes. we're embarrassed. Yeah. Three 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 F one heads and we can't remember. But yeah, there was there was one occasion where there was three. There was a couple of occasions where there was two together and a few further back have right. had the same time as well. But uh hey, listen, you know, look, everybody knows I'm not a fan of Max in any way, shape, or form, but he won the race in a car that technically shouldn't have. Uh, he was complaining, you know, fa mm -hmm. fairly early on there was something wrong with the car, the balance was off, he didn't want to ride the curbs. So, you know, the correct calls, this is one of those moments where you, we, we need to understand, for those that don't understand or follow Formula One very closely, the pit wall well, can Here's what Max had direct. to say in the Max podcast. Oops. We've lost you, Sherman. We'll say up. I'm here. Uh, there's here Scott is. and Hello. there's Paul back. And we had a, pa you Paul's said. connection in is uh, going low where you're at. I no, we you have one bar. We both lost you. You over there. We, we lost you at the point where you, you know said, that drastic. Uh, Max had to say. Yeah. In, in the go ahead. You were going to tell us about okay. Max. Determined. Here's what Max had to say. We were I was gonna. There you go. I was going to put up what Max had to say. Now now I got you guys both back. Here we go. That's what you were about to say. I think if I would be driving in the back, nobody would be even doing anything in terms of reaction, right? I think it's normal when you are winning and they don't like who is winning. So is this something for me which uh, is absolutely fine as long as I stand on the top? That's for me the most important. I take the trophy home and they go back to their houses and uh, they can uh, have a nice evening. That was Miami. What do you last year? What, that what was do you? Miami, 2023. What, what do you think about what uh, what uh, Max had to say there, Scott? Well, often people who well look, Max is not a very charismatic champion. He doesn't care about social media. He doesn't care about PR. He's not a he's not an Ayrton Senna or a Lewis Hamilton in terms of a publicly charismatic champion. But it is true that when one team and one driver is wiping the floor with the others, fans often will not like that driver, or some fans will. 
Um, that's true. But he, the race he was referring to is Miami, large Hispanic population. They remembered what he did to Checo in Brazil, which was not a good look. What do you, what do you have to say, Paul? Well, I was, I was Paul, saying, can you, dark, hi, can you hear me? Scott, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Scott can hear me, Sherman. Can you? I can hear you. Mm -hmm. I can hear you. Hi. Okay. So, look. I can uh, hear you. Everybody, everybody yeah. knows that I'm not a Max Verstappen fan for several reasons. I, I, still, I seriously still believe that he's a one-trick pony, uh, you know, slip, slipstream down the inside, forget to turn at the corner, nerf his opponent off track. And when he's got a car that's putting him ahead, he is skilled. Can't take that away from him. Um, he's, you know, he, he is definitely a world champion. Um, but again, I think that it just lacks because of his charismatic approach or lack of it just doesn't make him a likable person particularly and the fact that he's driving for red bull which i believe is just the most toxic team that's ever ever produced itself on the on the pit wall uh, up and down the pit lane i just don't have a heart for for red bull i never did um i didn't like them when seb was there and i was so grateful when seb left and became a human being at ferrari um so you know it, basically asking me about max is never a good idea i don't hate the guy but i just i i get tourettes when he comes on the television my <laughs> finger automatic i i swear to god every time it's just like and you know so i'm not going to say it on a podcast but it's true i just don't have time for max because of i just think it's him and i don't like the way he drives particularly but he is in a good car and he's a skilled driver and you cannot take that away from him so um, did he? Now, did Scott, he you were there in the paddock, in the in in the club, in the Red what Bull. Did you hear? Or, yeah, you were in the Red Bull paddock yeah, club. So, what did you hear that maybe we didn't? Sure. Uh, watching heard, the race. Yeah, I mean, what I heard in FP3 when I had the headphones on was a car that was not that when you know after the public session was over, the drivers were told that the public could no longer hear them and. They were bitterly complaining that the car was undrivable and was not responsive, that they were having huge problems over the curves, and that it was cut just there was no traction at all. Um, and they had the same conditions in the race, uh, excuse me, yeah, as in FP3. And, um, you know, Max managed to, uh, you know, qualify the car anyway a few hours later, at, you know, P2, and then he executed a nearly flawless race. And I want to be clear. Max did not have the dominant car that day. He didn't even have a highly competitive car. He had a mediocre car that day. Uh, not the typical Red Bull performance where, you know, where he was 10 or 20 seconds ahead. He had a lousy car. And he still did enough, put himself in a position to win when the safety car went his way. So my opinion, not a charismatic guy, doesn't care about PR, not particularly publicly likable that way. But I think he's a fabulous driver, even when he's not in a dominant car. Um, mm -hmm. And he, he, he's a multiple world champion. He deserves to be. I don't think he's a one-trick pony, but I don't think he's a likable guy either. I just think that he's incredibly talented because he's very one-dimensional. When Max is not driving F1, what does he do? He's on a sim rig driving esports, um, just like Fernando. When Fernando isn't driving F1, what does Fernando do? flies back to Spain, goes to his go-kart track, and drives go-kart. There are exactly two people in F1 who do this, Fernando and Max. No one else does this. Everyone else goes with their girlfriends, or they go on, they, they, they do singing, or they do holidays, or they do other things. They do Hollywood clothing, fashion shows. These two men are identical in the way that they approach driving. It's their passion. It's their life. It's the only thing that really, truly fascinates them. And... Max, in that sense, is a younger version of Fernando, who is also a polarizing thing. But I like Fernando stuff. Okay. Well, we're coming up on the hour here, and I know Paul. Paul's all the way in Ireland. It's probably getting really late. Yeah. It's probably like one or two in the morning over there. And I want to thank no, it, Paul it, it, for it, joining us today. Around. What is it? Quarter, quarter to eleven. Happens, well, but, you know, but I do need to go. <laughs> probably past your bedtime. <laughs> yeah, getting there, I have to get but, up at quarter past six. Yeah, I, I want to thank, I want to thank Paul and Scott for joining us today on our Canadian Grand Prix recap. And 
join us here at America F1 later on in the week where we do a Spanish Grand Prix preview show. So thanks to Scott. Thank you. Thanks to Paul. And keep on racing, everybody. Thank you. We'll do that. Are we clear? All right.